Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio, Mystery, Suspense, Dramas, and Horrors, where we bring to you the most mysterious tales that the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with 314 episodes made, originally airing on the NBC network from 1949 to 1957, we bring to you Dragnet. <laughs> gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. $8,000 worth of Chinese jade has been stolen. The criminal is vicious. His weapon, a handful of buckshot in a handkerchief. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, December 1st. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 7.15 p.m. when we got to the police academy, the banquet room. Where do we sit, Joe? Lee Jones is holding a couple seats for us someplace. You see him? Oh, yeah, yeah. There he is up there. Look at him. Everybody's here. Yeah, ought to be. Hi, fellas. A couple of ringside seats. Thanks, Lee. Did you get it? Yeah, right here. Mind if I take a look at it? No, go ahead. How come you didn't get it wrapped as a gift? No time. A gift box would have been nice. No cotton, even? Ah, beautiful watch. Radium dial? Yeah. Universal Geneva. Fine movement. He'll like it. Look on the back. Let's see. For Chief Ed Backstrand, a good cop, detective bureau. Not very good engraving. No time. I didn't think the old man really meant it. 26 years. You get tired after 26 years. You've been at it 25, Lee. Don't look at me like that. I got a book to finish. 23 chapters. How many chapters you got, Fanny? Two. How long you been writing it? Two years. Well, at that rate, we'll be stuck with you for another 21 years. If you're lucky. Excuse me, fellas. Got to make a speech. All right, Lee. Proceedings underway here. Before we introduce the man of the hour, I'd like to pass along a little story you might get a kick out of. <laughs> I was driving down from Utah last year, stopped off at a hotel in Elko, Nevada. When I went up to register for my room, there was an Indian ahead of me. The clerk asked his Indian fellow to sign his name, and the clerk handed him a pen. The Indian made a neck on the book. Clark looked at him for a minute and said, Say, aren't you Chief Deerskin? Haven't I seen you in the movies? The Indian nodded his head and looked a little upset. Oh, he said. Oh, he make a lot of movies in Hollywood. <laughs> the clerk smiled and said, A lot of people in Alpha here would like to get your autograph, Chief. And then the Indian grabbed the pen up again and he said, Me no like a autograph, hunters. 
We no want to be bothered. Then he drew a circle around the axe he made. The clerk said, Why you do that, Chief? The Indian said, We no use the right name. Oh, <laughs> oh hey, Joe. Yeah. yeah, there's Rogers over there. He's motioning to where? Oh, yeah, excuse me, Madam. Chief was retiring tonight. But he's been using his right name for 26 years, and he's proud of it. And we're proud to have been associated. Do you want me, Rogers? A phone for you, Joe. You can take it on the extension. Thanks, Pete. After 26 years of service, he's retiring from the Los Angeles Police Department. We're going to miss it. Gentlemen, a fine officer, Chief Ed Baxter. Where's the phone? Uh, right over here. Thanks. Friday. Joe, this is Gonzalez. Yeah, Jeff. Sorry to bother you, but Power said I should call you. Yeah? I need some legwork. Something big? Pretty big, yeah. Too many loose ends. Penny and I can't pull them all in. When do you want us? As soon as you can get down here. That important, huh? A man may die, Joe. Hi, Jess. Got here as soon as we could. Sorry to pull you away. Hello, Romero. Gonzalez, what's up? Come on in here. All right. Here's a report. Not complete yet. Uh-huh. Chinese fellow. Name's George Kwan. He's a jeweler, gem cutter. Yeah. Jade expert. Knows as much about jade as anybody on the coast. Uh-huh. Says it happened at 5.30 today on Alvarado near the park. Hmm. They weren't kidding, were they? They almost killed him. Yeah. Any idea what the weapon was, Jess? I'm not sure. Looks like some sort of blackjack, something homemade. Yeah. When they picked up Quan, they found several buckshot pellets lying around and a man's handkerchief. Ray Pinker has the stuff over in the crime lab now. Where's Quan? Have you talked to him? Got in a couple of questions down at Georgia Street while the doc was giving him sedatives. Little guy's a mess, Joe. It's gonna be all right. Fifty-fifty chance when I called you out of the academy. Well, why did they beat him? Do you resist? I don't have it all yet, but from what he said, he was jumped from behind. Didn't have a chance to fight. Whoever it was kept beating him long after he was unconscious. What would they take him for? A couple of pieces of jade. Large ones. Very rare. Mm-hmm. You got anything else? Yeah, we got a star witness. Just one. Did you talk to him yet? Just did for an hour and a half. You want to crack at it? Are you having trouble with him? Yeah, a little. All right, Pena. Send him in again. Yes, sir. You want to talk some more? Six years old, Joe. His name was Norman Eugene Fisher, and he was six years of age last April. Like all young boys his age, his imagination ran away with him. What would be only a minor detail to an adult witness assumed tremendous proportions in Norman's young mind. He told us his story three times. Each time he elaborated a little more until what he claimed was the truth could only have been figments of a small child's imagination. Ben and I, together with Gonzalez and Pena, talked with the boy for another hour. We were getting tired, but Norman enjoyed his position as star witness. Once more, Norman, please, try to remember it as it really happened. It was just like I said. Let me try, Jess. Go ahead, Romero. Um, you did see it happen this afternoon, didn't you, Norman? Yes, sir, I did. Good. Now, you were on your way home from the store. Oh, no, sir. I was running away from a man. He was chasing me. But you just told us, Norman, that you were on your way home from the store. Oh, no, sir. That was yesterday. But you told us. Listen a minute, Ben. Norman, how old are you? Next year, I'm going to be 21. No, that's not right. 21, that's older than I am. Well, when I am 21, I'm going to get a hot rod. Fastest car in the world. 10,000 miles an hour. Sure you will. But how old are you now? Six, but I'm born in... But I'm going to be 21 soon. I remember when I was six years old, Norman. A lot of things I wanted. Electric train. I got one. Well, it must be something you'd like to have. One thing that maybe now that you don't have, huh? Will you give it to me? Well, if I can. What do you want? I'd like your gun. Well, what do you want a gun for? I want to put people in jail like you guys do. Sometimes it takes more than a gun, Norman. What do you mean? Just because you've got a gun doesn't mean you're a cop. Well, what does? Just a minute, son. Norman, a good cop uses this more than a gun. Gee. It's a real police badge. It's mine. Official? Official. Can I hold it? Go ahead. It's yours. 
When I wear this, I'm a real detective. Well, that's part of it. The other part is to tell us what you really saw today. Now, how about it, huh? There were four men, like I said, and they all had machines. No, no, wait a minute, Norman. I thought you said you were a detective now. I am. Well, a good detective has to remember exactly what he sees, not something he makes up. It's not very scary that way. No, it's no use, Joe. He can't get his story straight. Oh, yes, I can. I'm a detective now, and I know what happened. All right, Norman, you tell us, huh? I was on my way home from the store. I saw this truck stop down the street. What did the truck look like? I don't know. It was a funny kind of truck. Had a wood back. You mean like a dump truck? Kind of, but it was a small truck. Old kind of car, like he took out the back part and put wood boards like a truck. You mean whoever owned the truck cut the back end out and made it look like a truck, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's the way it looked. Anyway, this truck stopped by this Chinese man, and the man got out, and the man started to hit this man. And the man fell on the sidewalk, and the man kept hitting him and hitting him as hard as anything. Well, what was he hitting him with? With his handkerchief. There he goes again. No, I don't know. How about that, Jess? Good tie-in. Go on, Norman. Well, that's all I saw. No, no, I mean after the man hit him, what did he do? Oh, well, he grabbed a bunch of stuff from this man's pocket... And he went into the truck and he speeded away. Norman, you're a good detective. I want you to think real hard now. Do you know what a license number is? Yeah. Good. Do you think you could remember the numbers on that truck? If I, if I knew what they were, I could. In school, we're just having numbers. Now, I only know up to seven, but there were two sevens in it. You're getting all this, Jess? Yeah, keep them. Norman, you've helped us a lot. Can you remember what the man on the truck looked like? He had a big head and he looked mean. All right, just one more thing now. Can you remember the color of that truck? It looked black, but the back part had black and white stripes. I don't know how you did it, Joe. Well, what do you think? How about it? Me too. All right, Norman. Your mother's waiting outside for you. You can go home now. You're a real detective. Can I wear my badge now? You bet you can. Okay. Say. Yes, sir? As soon as I arrest somebody, will you put him in jail? With the help of an outdated police badge, no longer official, we had the statement of a six-year-old boy with a healthy imagination. We had an idea he was telling us the truth, but we had no way of being certain. Since he was the only witness, we had to accept his word and hope that he was putting us on the right track. The quickest way to make sure was to see if some of the details in little Norman Fisher's story would check out. Jess Gonzalez and Manuel Pena took the job of trying to locate a homemade pickup truck with two sevens in the license number. They started by checking all the late 3.8 forms, the vehicle theft and impound reports. The next morning, Ben and I called the general hospital and talked with Dr. Sebastian. He told us that the victim, George Kwan, had improved sufficiently to allow a brief interview. It was 10.14 a.m. when we got to Ward C, General Hospital. Doctor tells us you're a little better this morning, Mr. Kwan. Yes, sir. I shall be all right. Although it is quite painful at times. We're sorry to bother you, Mr. Kwan, but we've got to have a little more information on the robbery. Oh, I will tell you all I can, sir. I should like to recover the missing jade pieces. It is a great loss to me. Did you get any kind of a look at the man who hit you? Oh, he attacked me from behind, knocked me to the pavement. I made an attempt to get to my feet, but he struck me again and again, here at the base of my neck. You didn't see him at all, then? No, sir, I did not. Do you have any idea who could have done this? Unfortunately, no, I... I cannot think of anyone. Well, what was stolen from you? We know it was Jade, but can you give us a more detailed description? Well, sir, I lost two thumb rings. Very rare. Collector's items. Thumb rings? Huh? How much were they worth, would you say? Well, I paid 8000 for the two rings. I wonder if you could describe them to her. Well, both rings were relics of the time when the Chinese archer drew his hunting bow with a special thumb ring. Uh-huh. Any particular identifying marks on them? Oh, uh, they both have linings of fine gold to fit them to the fingers of the new owners. Who were the new owners? I had just purchased them yesterday before I was robbed. I was on my way to San Francisco to show them to prospective buyers. Who did you buy the rings from, Mr. Quarren? Mrs. Inez Curtis, a very reputable dealer. We have done business for many years. I wonder if we could have her business address, huh? Uh, she has her office at her home. It is uh, uh, 1957 Harper Annex off Sunset Boulevard in Beverly Hills. Uh, how many people knew that you had the jade on you at that particular time yesterday? Oh, let me see. Uh, 
There were only two other buyers present beside Mrs. Curtis. I do not recall their names. They were new to me. Mrs. Curtis would know. Mr. Quan, we know that you're tired. We have just one more question. Certainly. I, I wonder if I might trouble you to hand me that tumbler of water with a glass straw. Surely. Here you are. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, those stumblings, Mr. Quan, would there be any practical disposition of them other than selling them as they are? Well, hardly, Sergeant. Uh, to anyone who really knows the value of jade, it would be unheard of to change them in any way. I see. Well, thank you, Mr. Kwan. We'll do our best. You know, Sergeant, we Chinese place a great sentimental value on our jade. We'll do everything we can to recover it. Thank you. Uh, may I tell you my favorite quotation on jade? Yes, sir. It is from the writings of Tong Jung Tso. He wrote... The magic powers of heaven and earth always combine to form perfect result. So the pure essences of hill and water become solidified in precious jade. Ben and I drove out to 1957 Harper Annex, the residence of Mrs. Inez Curtis. There was no one at home. We left one of our cars. It was 12.22 p.m. when we got back to Central Division. Here's a phone message for you, Joe. What's it say? Call Jess Gonzalez. He's at Wilshire Division. Okay, thanks, Ben. Wilshire Detectives, Dillion. Hi, Harry. Gonzalez around? Just a minute. Take it on three, Jess. Gonzalez. Friday, Jess. We got the truck and we got the driver. We'll be right out. Something else, Joe? Yeah. The kid was right. There were two sevens in the license number. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here is a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette, give the best of long cigarettes. Fatima. Give Fatima for quality. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Give Fatima for flavor. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima. They're extra mild. Yes, Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos blended to make Fatima extra mild. Yes, Extra mild. So give Fatima for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. It's the long cigarette that has doubled and redoubled its smokers. More and more smokers every day agree Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Wilbur Rasmussen, white male American, age 31, 5 feet 10 inches, 190 pounds, black hair, brown eyes. He was the driver of the truck. Gonzalez and Pena began by checking through all of the reports of trucks impounded during the past 24 hours. There were 23. Out of those 23, they narrowed it down to four possibilities. The third vehicle that they checked fitted the young witness's description of the holdup truck. We still could not be absolutely certain that the impounded truck was the one we were looking for. The same could be said of the driver, Wilbur Rasmussen. The net result of checking impound reports doesn't always result in the apprehension of a suspect, but in this case, we were lucky. The driver had been picked up for drunk driving. It was 1.30 p.m. when we checked in at the Wilshire Division. Hi, Jess. Where is he? You're a little late. What do you mean? He's gone, released on bail. Who furnished the bail? The woman he works for, Mrs. Inez Curtis. Well, that doesn't figure, Jess, or does it? Why not? How many people knew Quan had the jade? No, it's not my guess. Quan vouches for her. He's been doing business with her for years. What do you think, Joe? It's your show. I'm just tagging along. Well, one thing's sure. Just a minute. Where's your detectives, Gonzalez? Uh, yeah, Pena. He did? No, meet me back here. Hmm? Friday and Romero are here. Right. The Fisher kid just identified Rasmussen's picture. 
The identification of Wilbur Rasmussen by six-year-old Norman Fisher was far from sufficient to take the case to court. We had to have evidence, lots of it. Rasmussen had been given a thorough shakedown, his apartment and the truck. There was no sign of the stolen jade rings. Gonzalez told us that the truck had come from the U-Drive truck rental on Figueroa Street. We checked with Mr. Crockett at U-Drive. Uh, let me have another look at that picture, boys. Yeah, here you are. Uh, what did you say his name was? Rasmussen. Wilbur Rasmussen. You want to know if he rented a truck from Miss Wynn? Yesterday. Maybe the day before. No, not this fellow. Never seen him. Before we left U-Drive, we checked over the rental contract on the truck in question. The deposit check for the truck was signed by Mrs. Inez Curtis. The truck was checked out at 6 a.m. The rental contract, the actual release form showing to whom the vehicle had been rented, was signed by a Harry Wilson. Rasmussen's name did not appear on any of the usual rental forms. The manager of U-Drive was positive that he had not rented a truck to Rasmussen. We drove out to 1957 Harper Annex. This time we found Mrs. Inez Curtis at home. I'm terribly sorry about Mr. Korn. Does he have everything he needs in the hospital? Yes, ma'am. How long did you say this Harry Wilson had been working for you? Six or eight weeks. But I'm sure you're wrong about him. We're not accusing him of anything, Miss Curtis. We just won't talk to him. He certainly came to me well recommended. He was a nice man. When was the last time you saw him? Day before yesterday. He asked for his check, said he was quitting. Told him I was sorry to see him go. <laughs> I'm anxious to get that guest house finished. How about Rasmussen, Miss Curtis? How long has he been with you? Well, Wilbur's been with me for about seven months. Good worker, but he drinks too much. Feel sorry for him. You've rented trucks from the U Drive Company right along? Oh, yes, from Mr. Crockett. We had to have a truck to haul our building supplies. I'm saving an awful lot of money contracting this myself. It's a great saving. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the deposit on this last rental, did you give that check to Wilson or to Rasmussen? I sent both of them down to pick it up. Like I say, Wilby's been drinking rather heavily lately, and I think Harry's the better driver of the two. Do you know which one of those men was driving the truck about 5.30 in the afternoon, day before yesterday? Well, how would I know that, Sergeant? All I know is that I sent both of them down... I told Harry to drive. Yeah, I see. Miss Curtis, were either of those men present the day you sold the jade rings to Mr. Kwan? No. They have nothing to do with my gym business, whatever. Did either of these men know about Mr. Kwan's purchase? Well, that's possible. They knew he was here. I'm sure they saw him come in. It's entirely possible that they might have overheard something. When did Mr. Kwan leave your house? About five o'clock. What time did the two men go after the truck? Oh, they picked that up early in the morning. Mr. Crockett down at U-Drive says that only Harry Wilson checked out the truck. Says he's never seen Rasmussen before. That's entirely possible. Like I say, they might well have made other arrangements. Were there any other people present when Mr. Quine bought that jade? Yes, there were. Two other buyers. They were bidding for the thumb rings, too. Mr. Quine had the high bid, so I sold them to him. What if we could have their names? I certainly. I'll write them down for you. Miss Curtis, do you have any idea where we might locate Harry Wilson? Well, he told me he was going to Mexico. Said he had friends down there. Well, thank you, Miss Curtis. You've been very helpful. Are you sure there isn't anything Mr. Kwan needs? Yes, ma'am. Two G-8 rings. <laughs> Mrs. Inez Curtis gave us a detailed description of Harry Wilson. She also gave us the names and addresses of the two other buyers who were present when Mr. George Kwan made his purchase. We checked them out and found them to be equally as reputable as Mrs. Curtis. They could tell us nothing of the robbery. We went back to the office and got out an APB and a radiogram on Harry Wilson from the description given us by Mrs. Curtis. Stakeouts were maintained at Wilbur Rasmussen's apartment and at the home of Mrs. Inez Curtis. It was 4.30 p.m. when we got to the second floor of the old city jail building, the crime lab. Lee Jones had the evidence laid out for us. Anything about the handkerchief, boys? What's that, Lee? The bloodstains. Old ones along with the new ones. How does that figure? We know how the new ones were made when the handkerchief was filled with buckshot and used on Quan. The old ones, hard to tell. How old would you say they were? Well, the handkerchief has been through the laundry a few times. Stains didn't come out. Laundry marks right here. I don't see them. Man used peerless laundry. Infrared marking system. Let me show you. Mm-hmm. Infrared lamp, please? Yeah. There's your marking. Can you trace it down? Who's it belong to? Man used the name of Harry Wilson. There was nothing to do now but wait for some word on Harry Wilson. The stakeouts continued. We requested Wilbur Rasmussen, and we talked again with Mrs. Curtis and George Kwan. It was Tuesday, December the 8th. We checked in for work at 8 a.m. 
Morning, Jess. Hi, Joe. Where's Ben? Communications. Getting the mail. Any word on the new chief of detectives? No, nothing. What's your guess? Oh, I think Thad Brown. He's a good man. Maybe. Sloan's a good man, too. When you come in here? Not yet. Why? Maybe you'd like to take a little airplane trip. What do you got? Cheyenne, Wyoming. They picked up Harry Wilson. Two days later, Thursday, December the 10th, Harry Wilson was returned to the Los Angeles County Jail and booked on suspicion of robbery. We checked with Lieutenant Frank Cunningham in the record bureau. From Wilson's fingerprints, he ran a make on him. Harry Wilson was an alias. We found out that he had lengthy records of arrests and jail terms for robbery, burglary, and grand larceny. Mr. Crockett at U Drive identified Wilson's picture. He was a two-time loser. It's up to you, Wilson. It can go hard for you or easy. I'm in a spot, huh? You're in a spot. Lay it out for him, Jess. It's all stacked against you, Wilson. We know you rented the truck. You knew Quan was at Mrs. Curtis' house. Your handkerchief was found at the scene of the crime. You wouldn't believe me if I said I didn't do it? With that kind of evidence, how can we? I didn't. I don't know if I can prove it, but I didn't. If you didn't, we'll help you prove it. First, you gotta believe me. You know why. Yeah. I've had it twice. Once more, and I'm in for life. All right, you got it figured. Now, what do you got to say? Rasmussen did it. He knocked Quan over. Where were you? Find my ticket for Cheyenne. I didn't want any part of it. How do you account for that handkerchief? It was mine, but Rasmussen had it. He got his finger one day in the job. I loaned it to him. Well, that checks. Old blood stains, new ones. All right, let's pick up Rasmussen. While you're at it, pick up the Curtis stain. She planned it. Wilbur Rasmussen was picked up and brought in. After intense cross-questioning, we confronted him with Harry Wilson's statement. In the face of this testimony, he broke completely. He gave us a full confession implicating Mrs. Inez Curtis. He admitted beating George Kwan and taking the jade thumb rings. He said he received $200 from Mrs. Curtis for the job. He requested that he be allowed to turn state's evidence. Mrs. Inez Curtis was brought to the interrogation room. Of course, you gentlemen have proof to substantiate all these accusations. Yes, ma'am, we have. It better be good. I have a fine lawyer. We've got signed and recorded confessions of Wilson and Rasmussen, the two men who worked for you. Can we play the recordings for you? That won't be necessary. Miss Curtis, you got $8,000 for those rings. Wasn't that enough? Not when I could make 16, no. Where are the rings now? I'm not going to get life for this, you know. No. Jade doesn't spoil. It'll still be good when I get out. Yeah, but you'll be too old to appreciate it, Miss Curtis. Okay, Penny. Well, that was a funny one. Sure was. How about it? Did you figure it this way, Joe? You don't expect me to answer that, do you? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 2nd, 1949, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here are authentic reports from all over the country that tell the story of Fatima's sensational increase in popularity. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up. 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. Yes, more and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself and give extra mild Fatimas for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Mrs. Inez Curtis was tried and convicted of robbery and conspiracy. She received the maximum sentence as prescribed by law. In consideration for turning state's evidence, Wilbur Rasmussen received a minimum term. You have just heard Dragnets, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the city of Knoxville, state of Tennessee, and the men who make up the Knoxville Police Department, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Sergeant Joe H. Roberts, director of the Knoxville City School Safety Patrols, 
who dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Let that merry tune remind you to get him the big Christmas humidor of smooth, sure-fresh velvet pipe and cigarette tobacco. It's a double pleasure to any smoker when you give this generous humidor of velvet. It smokes cool and sweet in both pipe and cigarette. In every way, the gift for him is a Christmas humidor of velvet, America's smoothest smoke. Be sure to listen to Dragnet next week. Your tune for the stars on NBC. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.